we remembered it this time. Good deal. I'm going to go ahead and admit everyone in the waiting room. Hello and welcome. We're going to get started in a, just a few minutes. We're going to give it about two minutes for the room to fill up. We still have people coming into our waiting room. Welcome, we have folks still coming in our waiting room. So we will be admitting the rest of our guests and starting in just a few minutes. Michelle, can you see that screen? I can. Wonderful. Wonderful, thank you. Welcome to the Research Journal Club for National Hemophilia Foundation. We are just gonna get a few more people in from the waiting room and we'll start at 4.01. And I'm gonna end up muting myself so you don't hear the ding dong of all these folks in a second. Okay, it looks like our room is filling up, welcome to the Research Journal Club. This is our first of four sessions this year. Um, this session is being recorded and will be on our website for enduring um, credits, um, potentially early May is our hope, first or second week it will go live. With that, I'm Samantha Carlson um, from the Research Department and I will turn it over to Dr. Michelle Whitcup who will be introducing our speaker and helping facilitate the discussion today. She is our Vice President of Research Strategy at the National Hemophilia Foundation. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Samantha, and welcome everybody. We have a, a wonderful group of people. We have a, a nice smattering of the community of providers, uh, researchers, industry. So we're really excited for Dr. Annette Vendrikalski to be able to share this um, research study with us. Next slide. Um, as always, we wanna share our mission statement with you. Next slide. We also have a research department mission statement. And as um, with the other, we want uh, to see a world without inheritable blood disorders, but we do believe that it begins with research. And our goal is to advance person-centric research that will enable people and families with inheritable blood disorders to thrive. Next. We started our research journal club because we really wanted to have this opportunity to engage with the community um, and demonstrate uh, that research can become something that the entire community can get behind. Um, that it isn't something that just researchers do, but it can be uh, something that can be ingrained into everyday life. So we want to be able to share some of the more recent research and how that can translate into your life, as well as uh, practitioners uh, that they can translate that into their everyday practice. So how, how we manage these research journal clubs is we have a brief overview of the article. And Dr. Van Dragalski is going to be um, presenting two articles today, um, followed by a discussion of the findings. And then also included in that will be an overview of the impact on the care and um, how this impacts the community. How can this research be translated into practice as well as um, how can that be something that people within the community can translate into their everyday lives? We do want to have you have the opportunity to um, have questions with Dr. Van Dragalski. There's a chat feature in the bottom of your screen, and we would encourage you to put any questions into that chat, and we will be sharing those with um, Dr. Van Dragalski at the end of her session. As Samantha said, this is in enduring, which means we're recording it, and we will be putting it on our website for persons, uh, for physicians and nurses, we do have continuing medical, medical education credits 
that are available. And um, those credits will be, will have the information at the end of this session, and they'll be available for others who want to watch this on our website. So with that, and um, Sam, thank you. These are Dr. Vandragalski's um, disclosures. And I just want to inter introduce her. She is a professor of clinical medicine and the director of the Hemophilia and Thrombosis Treatment Center at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, Dr. Vandragalski is dedicated to the care of patients with hemophilia and bleeding disorders, addressing the needs of aging patients with hemophilia, such as new therapies, cardiovascular disease, and hypertension, as well as the progression of hemophilic joint disease. Dr. Vandragalski investigates gene therapy and other novel molecules and elucidates effects of new treatments on the pathobiology of joint health, both at the bench and in translational studies. She has pioneered musculoskeletal ultrasound for rapid joint bleed detection and joint evaluation in hemophilia. Dr. Vandragalski developed a focus in international outreach to afford training for hematologists from developing countries and established care for patients with hemophilia and bleeding disorders in Mozambique, as well as address mortality from postpartum bleeding. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Aneta Vandragalski. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's really an honor to speak to you today. And Michelle has asked that I review two articles that are intertwined, as we will see. And these would be the learning objectives. Um, can you see? Can you all see my slides? Okay. Since um, you are right in front of me here, I'm looking at you, but I'm working from two screens, so I will look over here for the for the talk and then come back to you um, in direct view. So the learning objectives are to discuss that vascular remodeling in hemophilic joints is associated with hypertension and high blood pressure. Um, second, explain the importance of further research due to the high risk for morbidity and mortality in hemophilia patients, evaluating these pathways um, between vascular joint remodeling, hematopathy, and blood pressure. And then describe systemic vascular basement membrane markers and their correlation to synovial vascular remodeling related to hemarthrosis. So the two articles uh, will comprise one from 2020 here to the left and one from 2017, both from our group describing once the hypertension of hemophilia is associated with vascular remodeling in the joint and then systemic vascular basement membrane markers linked to synovial remodeling are biomarkers of hemarthrosis in patients with hemophilia. One was um, published in the Journal of Microcirculation and the other one in JTH. Then we will discuss the findings, obviously, emulate the two because somehow they come together, as you will see or could, and um, derive some new hypotheses from that. And there you have to help me. So um, background in terms of vascular remodeling. Joint bleeding is associated with reactive synovial hypertrophy and vascular remodeling. And so the vascular remodeling is associated with vessel fragility and more bleeding. And more bleeding fuels more vascular changes with even more bleeding. So you can easily see that that results in a vicious cycle of what I like to call here, it's in quotations, vascular bleeding, fragility. And that is somewhat independent of coagulation or hemostasis um, as derived by new non-factorless treatments or clotting factor. So look at the panel below, and this shows or visualizes this vascular remodeling here exemplified by pronounced expression of alpha SMA that stands short um, for a mesenchymal marker of vascular remodeling. It's smooth muscle actin. And as you can see here in this panel, it's a histological panel of synovial um, hypertrophy um, here in humans and below in mouse models, each time shown for factor eight deficient mice for osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. And you can easily see that these, these things here, these structures are vessels. Um, the red is the alpha SMA staining and it's really thickened, elongated, completely abnormal shapes here in humans and in mouse models of hemophilia. 
And you can see that these shapes are also present in osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, but to a much lesser extent and not as pronounced. So this vascular remodeling is really something unique to hemophilia. And this is here a patient to exemplify that in, a, in an angiogram, a patient of mine who several years after liver transplantation, which for other reasons, which has cured him from the hemophilia, still has this pronounced vascular abnormality in the, in this, in the elbow joint and started to have quite some bleeding um, with aspirin, which he had to take for other reasons. Um, and you can see here in the angiogram, this abnormal vessel structure with leakiness in the angiogram. And this is his ultrasound at the same time, um, showing these power Doppler signals. These are vascular signals that are highly abnormal. So that bleeding did not respond to more clotting factor. It was too, too normal to begin with um, and needed embolization. Now we come to hypertension and the background of hypertension because at the end we have to marry the two. So the prevalence of hypertension in patients with hemophilia seems to be increased um, compared to the general population. There have been multiple um, studies, quite some large. Hypertension predisposes to intracranial hemorrhage and we should always have in mind that the risk of death from intracranial hemorrhage in patients with hemophilia is about 10 to 40 fold higher when compared to age matched non hemophilic males. Well, that is important because um, hypertension is a predisposes to intracranial hemorrhage and it's very prominent in, in hemophilic patients. So the hypertension of patient in patients with hemophilia is associated with usual cardiovascular risk factors as they are encountered in the general population. Let's pick one, for instance, smoking or obesity. But the excess risk of the hypertension encountered in the patients with hemophilia or persons with hemophilia cannot be easily explained by those factors. So what is the etiology? So the first study of the day is the hypertension of hemophilia is associated with vascular remodeling. Um, and the hypothesis here is that hypertension and blood pressure may be associated with joint health because it's sort of a hemophilia specific factor often beyond the usual risk factors. And so what could the role of vascular remodeling be? Is there one? So that was a prospective single center pilot study done here at UCSD with 28 um, patients with hemophilia. They had moderate and severe hemophilia and we examined 160 AD joints in those patients. And we used joint um, specific parameters like hemophilia joint health score, radiographic Pedersen score and joint vascularity by ultrasound and power Doppler. And I will show that in a moment. Um, but we also used clotting factor consumption, BMI, pain score, age, and also high, high sensitivity CRP. So this would be hemophilia joint health score. And here you see a radiographic Pedersen score with a really um, gone, joint, space, joint space is gone. But here I want to explain the power Doppler score to you. So that's the view into an ankle joint anteriorly. You see a, a very disjointed joint line with some synovial hypertrophy. Um, this would be here and a bleed on the bottom, this would be here. And this would be a power Doppler score of one. You see one little speck in a normal joint, there would be no power Doppler signal at all. So that would be a power Doppler signal of zero. So that's one. Um, this here in the uh, area of interest would be a two, which means confluent um, vessels, but less than 50% of the area of interest. Remember this is a bleed, this is um, fluid, and this is synovial hypertrophy. And this would be also confluent, but more than 50% of the area of interest. So that becomes a power of a score of three. So the study design was such that um, the joint evaluations comprised both elbows, knees, and ankles. Um, the ultrasound was high resolution. This is the machine we used and we used the CHATE protocol. Um, the power Doppler score was scored semi-quantitatively in three joint locations and then averaged. Um, so we also assessed pain by visual analog scale for each joint and the mean was calculated for each subject. And then the physician performing the ultrasound was, was me, was blinded to blood pressure and or the diagnosis of hypertension. We extracted a bunch of other data um, from the 
electronic medical record, and then used um, definitions for hypertension and blood pressure norms as defined by the American Heart Association. And then we calculated mean systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure from each patient um, with blood pressure measurements available over the preceding 12 months. And they were about um, one to a, a range of one, one to 37 per patient. So um, on average, we had about seven available to us. And these are the cohort characteristics. Um, you can see that they are middle aged, 37 years old. Most of them are white. BMI is 27. Um, uh, you can see that high sensitivity CRP here is only one. And I want to point out that the cutoff for normal is below five. So it's really important to point out that hemophilia, unlike rheumatoid arthritis, at least at baseline, is not a really systemically inflammatory or systemic inflammatory disease. Um, this is clotting factor usage, and here you can see mean systolic and diastolic blood pressures. 54% of the patients were hypertensive, and about two-thirds of them were treated for their hypertension. And that sort of is actually um, what the national norm is. If you go outside and look around, about two-thirds of patients with hyper or people with hypertension um, are treated. That leaves still one-third untreated. Most of them had hemophilia A, most of them had severe hemophilia. We examined all six joints, and these are the total joints. And then you see the mean Pedersen score, hemophilia joint health scores. And so if we had a broad array, as they are sort of middle high, they had a broad array of um, hemophilic manifestations. And um, the pain score here, again, 0.5. That's not terribly high, just showing that at baseline, most patients don't run around with terribly painful joints. And then that's the power Doppler score. So um, these are the comparisons of the patients or their, um, their characteristics as continuous variables divided between not hypertensive and hypertensive patients. And as you read through all of them, you can see that only the power Doppler score here, um, age, and clotting factor usage were different between the patients with and without hypertension. So hypertensive patients had a higher power Doppler score. They were older and they interestingly um, used less factor. And then if you, one goes to that same algorithm with categorical variables like race, hemophilia type, severity, and viral status, there were no differences noted between the patients with and without hypertension. Now we come to the really important results that, and those show that um, there is an association of hypertension and blood pressure with vascular remodeling. And this was adjusted for Pedersen scores, which was the strongest confounder. There were other confounders as well as clotting factor usage and pain, et cetera, but this was the strongest confounder. And what we found was that there was an odds ratio of hypertension that was increased by 1.27 for each unit increase of the power Doppler score. And that was highly statistically significant. And as you can see here in this panel, there is a strong association at least of systolic blood pressure and somewhat also diastolic blood pressure, but less impressive with um, power Doppler score. So the higher the power Doppler here, the higher the systolic blood pressure or the diastolic blood pressure. And this just gives you a representative example. This would be someone with a really low systolic blood pressure. Again, no inflammation, no vascular remodeling, and here that would be someone with a really high blood pressure. You can see all these red dots, which signifies vascular abnormalities and vas abnormal vascular flow in the synovium. So if we now um, just show one, so what about, you might ask, well, what about all the other um, variables or continuous variables? And so I have I have charted them down here. There were correlations present, if you read through it, for the power Doppler, as we just saw, and then also pain again, and or again, clotting factor usage and also pain. So you can see here pain score for systolic blood pressure was important um, and also for diastolic blood pressure. And so was clotting factor usage. Again, it seemed that patients who were hypertensive used less factor than those who were not hypertensive. And we have interrogated this whole clotting factor issue in another publication, in another paper, and dug much deeper into it in a multi-center cohort. And then that clotting factor usage sort of disappeared. It wasn't all that important anymore. 
So in summary, the examination of four joint specific characteristics for their associations with hypotension and blood pressure, medicine score, hemophilia joint health score, pain like visual analog score and power doppler score provided radiographic, clinical, pain-related, and vascularity-related assessments of joint, of joint status, respectively. And of these, only pain and the magnitude of power Doppler signals were associated with the hypertension and blood pressures. And then it is, was really remarkable that the risk of hypertension and systolic blood pressure elevation increased so steeply with an increasing power Doppler signal, even in just the 28 patients we interrogated. And um, so the observations made here are consistent with the hypothesis that vascular remodeling in hemophilic joints contributes to a greater risk of hypertension and elevated blood pressure. So in summary, may be continued. So this is a provisional scheme here provided, perhaps, perhaps perpetuated joint bleeding here into the joint space and vascular remodeling. As you can see here, these um, vessels get thick and, and, and ugly, um, are accompanied by local and or systemic mediators of angiogenesis and or inflammation depicted here, which then in turn might affect blood pressures. And it is to be noted that vascular remodeling in the micro or, ma micro or macro circulation is a hallmark of hypertension in general. So hypertension produces endothelial changes and vascular stiffness um, with molecular markers such as metalloproteases, vascular endothelial growth factors, and other things that we know from talking about synovial hypertrophy on a systemic level really contributing to, to blood pressure changes in, in non-hemophilia patients. So however, the molecular mechanisms of vascular remodeling that are associated with joint bleeding are currently unknown, and um, but may be intertwined with hypertension and blood pressure as we just alluded. But this is a loose scheme and less than satisfactory. It has many holes, but at some point it provides a provisional idea of what could, could happen. So, and in that sense, it remains unclear whether, whether vascular remodeling in the hemophilic joint is the cause or consequence of hypertension, but somehow it seems linked. And with that, we go to the second study that was, you know, we studied that four years later, but it, it might come back and round out the loop. So systemic vascular basement membrane markers linked to synovial vascular remodeling are biomarkers of hemarthrosis in patients with hemophilia. So now we look at these endothelial markers and find that there might be a linkage. So the hypothesis for this study was that markers of vascular endothelial turnover can be detected systemically in association with hemarthrosis, and that it may be possible to develop a systemic marker of acute joint bleeding. We didn't think of hypertension per se. The study's design was a prospective three-year study with hemophilia patients, and we also had an animal model for that in the factor VIII deficient mouse. So as to the patients, these were 31 adults with hemophilia. They were assessed during pain-free intervals and during painful events. And the objective bleed status during those painful events and their vascular flow during those events was ascertained with ultrasound and the power Doppler function. And then we tested tissue repair markers, 10 plasma markers of collagen turnover in the peripheral blood detected at those baseline studies and during these painful episodes with ELISA. And they were specific to basement membrane, i.e. vascular turnover, interstitial or extracellular matrix turnover, and bone and cartilage turnover. And then we did the usual joint health assessments as well. And in the hemophilia mouse model, um, we gave the mouse a knee injury to make it bleed and treated it plus minus treatment at the time just before and a few hours after um, with, with factor eight and compared the two and um, did assessments after two weeks. And we did the similar assessments, vascular assessments with ultrasound and power Doppler in the mice. I'll show, show you in a moment what that looks like. Um, histology, especially using this alpha SMA expression, which I showed you on, on one of the first, first slides, and then tested their plasma collagen turnover markers. And I would like to point out that in the mouse, this was after two weeks. In the patients, the acute episodes um, you know, were captured within 48 hours. So this is not entirely comparable, but close enough, as you will see. 
So this is the distribution of various types of collagen in the synovial connective tissue. And let me take you through this. So the distribution of various types of collagen is depicted here. It's made up of different layers and there are about 28 different collagens in these layers. And this is sort of a, mac, um, a super microscopic zoom, zoom in view showing you here the basement membrane as it then interdigitates with the interstitial matrix. And all of that sits on these endothelial epithelial cells. One, and they are all the different um, collagens that sort of are here more specific for vascular basement membrane and then become more specific for interstitial um, tissue. And then at some points not shown here, it's fibroblasts and then it becomes cartilage or bone. So what the takeaway message from this is or what I want you to think about is specific collagens for basement membranes and here specifically type four. Why? Because in the synovium, the only endothelial cells with basement membranes encountered are vascular cells. Everything else is fibroblasts or other cells. So it becomes very specific to vascularity. And so these are the patient and joint characteristics of this cohort. You can see again, middle-aged, broad Peterson score or high Peterson, relatively broad span of Peterson score and total hemophilia joint health score to show that these were a good representation of all kinds of manifestations. Um, mostly hemophilia A, again, mostly severe. And these were the, the number of episodes we had available for um, analysis. So you can see there's baseline midpoint and end of study at three years, and then we have painful episodes with hemarthrosis shown by ultrasound at 16 and painful episodes without hemarthrosis. And so overall, we had 90, 91 total visits to study, most of them pain-free, and then um, two-thirds, let's say, almost two-thirds bleeding and one-third non-bleeding. What you can see here on the right is the vascular flow abnormality um, that is present during acute bleeding. So on the x-axis here, I'm sorry, on the y-axis here, you have um, a power Doppler signal that's obtained at baseline in the joints um, and then compared to what happens if the patient shows up with a bleed and then what happens if there's a painful episode but no bleed. Clearly, this power Doppler signal is very high um, during bleeding, again, showing that together with bleeding, there is vascular remodeling and vascular abnormality ongoing. And so now what were the measurements of those collagen turnover markers? So here are the names of these markers and not that you have to remember them, but um, on top are the basement membrane endothelial specific ones. And here's one to, to point out Pro-C4, which is a meta meta metabolic, um, collagen type four turnover marker, and it's, synth it's a synthesis marker. And then we have C4M, which is sort of a degraded a marker of degradation. It's all for this type four collagen. And then there are several others. And then we have here the listing of the interstitial and the cartilage markers. And um, the outcome was that only two basement membrane markers and remember, and, endo and two endothelial markers, and remember these are very specific for vascular cells in the synovium, um, were elevated during painful episodes associated with hemarthrosis, indicating that hemarthrosis is associated with vascular tissue turnover that can be detected systemically. And the responses were transient since these markers did not change longitudinally over three years. So each time at the next visit, when they came for their next routine visit, they were down again. So, and this shows you the graphic depiction of basement membrane turnover. Here, this type 4 collagen synthesis and type 4 collagen breakdown shows that in relation to baseline, both are elevated and certainly can distinguish painful from non-painful episodes. And the same was true for two endothelial turnover markers here, type 8 collagen synthesis and this type 23 collagen um, synthesis as markers. Um, these, now I'm showing you correlations of these type 4 collagen turnover um, markers and power Doppler signal. So you can see here that both markers, so this would be the degradation marker, and here would be the synthesis marker, are proportional. So that means collagen synthesis and breakdown were com com 
proportional since they are so tightly correlated. And then also the type 4 collagen turnover correlated well with the magnitude of power Doppler signals and therefore is aligned with vascular remodeling. So here you see the power Doppler scoring and here you see um, an alignment or some form of correlation with these syntheses and the structure markers. To take it one step further, um, there was sort of an analysis to predict bleeding based, based on these markers. And um, so that was done by our collaborators showing the painful episodes using a cutoff marker of that C4M2 marker of 28.5, which was the median. And so you can see that there was a bleed of N equals five if one was below, but non-bleed pain seven, and then only one bleed if one went above 28 sorry, 11 bleeds if one went above 28.5 and um, only two if there was non-bleed pain. So together, that sort of translated into a sensitivity of 69%, a positive predictive value of 85%, and an overall odds ratio of 7.7 .7 in predicting hemarthrosis. Now, that's obviously not perfect, and I wouldn't suggest we use these markers to do this right now. It was remember we just had 25 episodes available to us to do this would need a much larger number to really nail this um, but it provides proof of principle i think that in principle it might be possible to find markers of bleeding and um and perhaps develop a blood test for bleeding rather than having to take ultrasound and so this was accompanied by mouse results um, in terms of measurement of basement um basement markers and endothelial collagen turnover markers. So we had previously demonstrated that type 4 collagen turnover markers are also elevated here two weeks following induced hemarthrosis in the factor 8 deficient mouse model. And that was done by one of my postdoctoral fellows, Esther Cook, who actually had a National Hemophilia Foundation Fellow Award. Yep. And so you can see that here compared to baseline, Two weeks later, um, if the mice just got saline, these markers are quite elevated or more elevated than if they got um, factor eight. So the response was um, reduced with factor eight. There was less, less bleeding. And so again, shows in the mouse that this could be recapitulated. We knew that already. So in the current study, we probed the extent to which vascular remodeling and type four collagen turnover correlate with the vessel number, with the power Doppler signals and with alpha SMA expression. And so these are the mouse results in terms of correlations. And I just want to show you here how this is done. We have a laptop ultrasound machine. Here's the mouse. And with a hockey stick bro probe, which is sort of almost as big as the mouse, we can zoom into the knee. You can see here the femur, you can see the tibia, and here's some synovial proliferation after in the meniscus, after joint injury. And then zooming in with the power Doppler, you can see that this knee here is quite inflamed and we can score this and measure this similar to what we do in patients. And so you can see that the power Doppler signals are sort of only mildly, yes, no, mildly associated um, with these type four collagen turnover markers. But there was a strong alpha SMA um, expression correlation and alpha SMA expression was decreased um, with thicker, sorry, thicker vessels had a decreased turnover of these type four collagen markers. And that is shown here. So type four collagen was associated with vessel thickness um, rather than vessel number and, and showed that sort of stronger vessels, more established vessels at the end of this remodeling process were tighter and had um, simply less turnover of these destructive or metabolic positive type 4 markers. So in summary, acute joint bleeding in hemophilia increased the abnormal vascular flow and vascular remodeling. Systemic markers of collagen type 4, which is specific to membrane basement membrane turnover, were increased after joint bleeding in hemophilia and correlated positively with abnormal vascular flow indicating increased vascular turnover during joint bleed episodes. The findings could be reproduced in a mouse model of hemophilic joint injury, and that will also help to continue this work because we have a mouse model. 
and the systemic collagen four markers may distinguish bleeding from non-bleeding painful episodes and provide proof of principle that joint bleeding in hemophilia can be detected systemically. So now we have to sort of build the bridge and link paper one and two. I think the takeaway point is that joint bleeding is associated with vascular remodeling and therefore perhaps a systemic vascular response that could affect, uh, have effects on blood pressure regulation and poses the question if high blood pressure affects joint health or joint health affects blood pressure. I think it's a bit unclear, but the, the hypotheses sort of evolve. What is next? Um, I have to point out that there is mounting evidence that hypertension and elevated blood pressure do influence osteoarthritis in the general population. There is a whole host of literature out there, and I'm just you know, citing one nature review in hematology in 2021 to draw your attention to this topic. Um, epidemiologically, and these are the key points the authors make, high blood pressure has been linked to radiographic and symptomatic knee osteoarthritis. At the tissue level, systemic hypertension leads to subchondral bone perfusion abnormalities and ischemia, which disrupts angiogenic, osteogenic coupling and impairs the integrity of the bone cartilage functional unit. At the molecular level, you have systemic activation of the renin-angiotensin system, endothelin, and wind beta catenin signaling, and that can induce a phenotypical change in these articular chondrocytes and triggers cartilage destruction. And again, I think no one knows quite well if it's really the hypertension that causes these, has the effect on the joints, or if it becomes a vicious cycle where more joint disease then leads to more hypertension or higher blood pressure. In any event, they postulate that antihypertensive medications that exhibit chondroprotective events in preclinical studies warrant further investigation in patients with osteoarthritis and that they encountered comorbidity of systemic hypertension. So I think it relates well to what we see in, in hemophilia and maybe see in hemophilia at an exaggerated pace. So with that, I thank you very much um, and hope for a lively discussion. Thank you, Dr. Vandragalski. That was um, very, very interesting. And um, for me, stimulated a lot of questions. Um, we, and I would encourage if anybody has any questions to put them into the chat. There is one question right now um, from Dr. Dima Kelly. And she asks specifically, the vascular remodeling data is interesting. Could the remodeling in joint synovium be a marker for systemic angiogenesis involving other tissues such as large muscle or potentially the brain? And then also she says she may have missed this, but was there any correlation between hypertension and other cardiovascular disease? Yes, thank you, Donna, for the two questions. To your first questions, that might be, but we don't know. So this is whatever we see in the synovial in the synovium in terms of this vascular remodeling in relation to bleeding. Could that be just a, a local sentinel? And then this also um, translates into other compartments of the body. And the question is, we don't the answer we don't know, but it could be. And then again, this is this feedback of hypertension and more vascular problems. There's one publication from Italy, it's now 10 years old or so, but showing that endothelial joint health, and they measure that by a, by a flow device, is poorer in patients with hemophilia than the general population. Um, so it shows that just flow through the endothelial vessels, not in the synovium, but actually that's done in, 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 in the arm, is poorer. So they have poorer endothelial health. So, yeah, it might, it might well be, but that's the only study I'm aware of. And then the second question, what was that again? Was there any correlation between hypertension and other cardiovascular um, oh. disease? Yeah, there is. So it's just as in the general population, there is a correlation with all the usual risk factors, be it BMI, smoking, I mean, you name it. It's just that that excess risk of hypertension that's noted if you compare non-hemophilia populations like in Haines or the Vinci databases of the veterans to regular hemophilia patients, that 
that excess risk cannot be explained by an excess of any of these factors. Okay. So this is where something hemophilia specific must come in. And so this is where perhaps all this vascular remodeling might play a role or something joint specific, for instance. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Let me see down here. Um, <clears throat> so the manuscript reports um, power, Doppler, power Doppler score, age, clotting factor usage, as the main variables that were different between those who were classified as hypertensive, having high blood pressure, and not hypertensive. The clotting factor um, usage was almost 90% more in the younger, not hypertensive group than in the older hypertensive group. And so that sort of leads to assumptions. And of course, these are totally assumptions of um, greater hemarthropathy secondary to uh, a decreased clotting factor usage. And you sort of wonder if that's episodic use. Um, as a treater, does that support prophy in that aging or older group population to prevent further vascular remodeling? Is there any potential prophylactic effect for hypertension as there is for um, joint health. Yeah, uh, so we were also floored by this. And so the, again, these were just 28 patients and we were very curious about that. So we studied this whole issue in almost 200 patients um, with a multi-center cohort and where we had clotting factor data available and then all of this went away. So that was published in the Journal of um, Hemophilia Practice we could not get that published, unfortunately, in in, a, in another journal. What, what, whatever reviewers had a lot of lots of questions, but point being, once we had um, almost two hundred patients and could look at blood pressures and hypertension and their clotting factor usage, there was really no difference. And um, yeah, so. <laughs> Initially, one would think, okay, if I do more clotting factor and have more factor eight, and then it, it goes all away, but or factor nine for that matter, but that was not true. So it even out once you once you added numbers to the whole game. Okay, all right. Um, and so if that's interested, I'm more than happy to send this publication because I think still I still think it's valuable, um, just to show. And uh, Michelle, you can distribute it if you like or, or whoever sure. wants it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, in that, um, that provisional scheme figure that you showed of the knee from the uh, microcirculation article, it showed a thickened vascular wall. And, and again, one would assume an associated um, increase in vascular stiffness. So how are microbleeds, what we know of as microbleeds, and they're often referred to as leaky vessels, um, how are those associated with that vascular restructuring within the walls that are thicker and firmer? Yeah, so I think that's a really great point question. So first of all, I don't think we have a good definition of microbleeds, but what I like to call microbleeds is exactly that. It's sort of the leaking into tissue rather than have, we always think about cavitary bleeds. That's our perception, right? Someone bleeds into the joint space, but really we have a lot of leakage into the surrounding synovium, what we know as hemosiderin and what we don't see in the cavity, in the joint cavity. And so with the, with the remodeling, we don't have really data, but that's the thought. With the remodeling of the vessels, the vessels try to get established and they try to get thicker, but that doesn't always mean that they are less leaky. Um, so especially if more bleeding comes to it, newer vessels, um, get generated and they start the, down that same process and during that process they are just leaky and that's the hemosiderin accumulation what one can quantify and see on, on MRI and something that doesn't come out on ultrasound or doesn't come out on any other studies that's what I call microbleeding and we interestingly know very little about that and how it affects health overall. Are there any studies going on in that area? Um, well, so our, our radiology group here, I'm a co-investigator on that, has received an, NI, an, R01, um, an R01 NIH grant to develop new sequences, very 
um, sensitive sequences to hemosiderin um, with fast MRI to quantify hemosiderin accumulation. And I think we need a tool like that to look exactly at that, to have a tool to measure this hemosiderin quantification over a certain period of time, maybe in association with certain treatments. And then, then we can correlate or have yeah, a quantification measure to relate it to other health outcome parameters. So that's in its infancy. And I think it doesn't get enough um, recognition really, because we always think about blood in the joint space, like in the cavitary space, but that's just one aspect of it all. Okay, all right. Um, and remember, if anybody has any questions, you can put them into um, the chat. Another um, area was that inflammation and local and or uh, systemic um, mediators of inflammation are mentioned as a possible effect on blood pressure. Yet the high sensitivity CRP, which is normally considered an inflammatory marker, was not considered to be uh, a confounder or really to be statistically significant. You pointed that out. Are there other inflammatory markers that we should be considering or monitoring? Yeah, so I am not, I have to say, I'm not enough of an expert in the field of hypertension. So this is, I think, where we have to get together with cardiologists to, to dive much deeper into the pathophysiology of hypertension and what it all means and link it back to hemophilia. I think that would be the next step. Okay, but overall in hemophilia, we're not necessarily seeing any inflammatory component. No, not from the CRP. So it's not like, I think what people always get confused is, um, certainly some patients will have a higher CRP because that's just the cardiovascular man manifestation, but it's not super high. Um, like you would, for instance, expect in rheumatoid arthritis to make that connection because hemophilia is not really a systemic inflammatory disorder. Rheumatoid arthritis is quite a different story. You have an underlying pathophysiology that's systemic. It's systemic inflammation that then manifests itself in the joint. Hemophilia is the other way around. We have joint bleeding and that's obviously not good, but it doesn't stimulate a really profound inflammatory response in the body. That's what I want to say. That's not to say it could be elevated in some patients, especially as they age, just in the general population, if that makes sense. But it, it wasn't a big confounder. Okay. Um, and then we, we do have a couple of questions here. Let me, um, let me go to them. First off, um, Michael Santorso asks, uh, how are the HTC docs helping primary care care for hypertension and high blood pressure? And um, I'm guessing, Michael, you're asking about the associated uh, joint disease that comes from bleeding. He puts in osteoarthritis. Yeah. So you mean in general, paying attention to hypertension, if that's the question? I think we can all do a much, much better job. And um, to tell you the truth, when I started this field, so to speak, 10 years ago, and I went through patient charts, that's how the, all this started. And everyone is hypertensive and no one was on hypertensive medications. We had about 10% on antihypertensives because no one really paid attention. And that has changed now, at least in our center to what I showed you about two thirds, which sort of is what's encountered in the outside world. But yes, and I'm sure in other centers, especially if patients are seen in pediatric centers, it's just not as much focus on it. And I think we can all do a better job. So part of it is raising awareness. And it's really important, again, comes back to, to brain bleeds because in the normal population, hypertension causes brain bleeds. And so of course, especially detrimental in hemophilia. So it's hard to explain to patients, especially young patients, because interestingly, young patients are at high risk of hypertension and hemophilia, and they don't want to take this excess, this another pill. They said, okay, I'm doing diet, I'm going to the gym, because they just don't see it. Um, and you have to push them, and then I'll explain to them, but it, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an upward struggle. And certainly a primary care could do better. Well, and, and also it's another reason to make sure that they're on prophylaxis 
Um, and they start at an early age and we prevent bleeds. Mm -hmm. we do everything we can to prevent bleeds. Yep. Yeah. Um, from Bob Robinson, how do you explain this to the patient? Um, uh, what you've uh, done succinctly, um, you know, that this is succinctly what I asked you directly. Okay. I'm not sure what you mean, Bob. <laughs> yeah. What I tell them is um, you have hypertension and we see that people with, hyper with uh, hemophilia have a, more of a propensity to have high blood pressure and you have to take pills, high blood pressure medications to really reduce your risk of, of intracranial bleeding. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm pounding home, so to speak. Okay. I, I don't go into vascular joints and stiffness and remodeling. I think that's too much, perhaps for most, too much information. It's just telling them, please take your blood pressure meds. Okay. And from Donna, is there any evidence of increased peripheral vascular resistance? associated with this phenomenon. Did I recall correctly that systolic hypertension correlated better with vascular remodeling than diastolic? Yeah, um, absolutely. So we don't, I don't know that particularly because we haven't studied it, but then again, there's this one publication 10, 10 years ago, I think it's Sartori et al, it's that Italian group that um, use flow mediated vascular dilation. That's where you, it's a very established procedure in cardiology. It's simple, but you take a blood pressure cuff, you really blow it up quite a bit and cause peripheral ischemia um, for, for a little bit. And then you release the blood pressure cuff really fast and measure endothelial stiffness reperfusion. And that's severely impacted in patients with hemo, persons with hemophilia compared in the, that group compared that to a, um, a matched group of hypertensive individuals without hemophilia and clearly found that it was worse in hemophilia patients. If that answers sort of the question, I think that's part of that vascular stiffness, not being able to relax the vessel, not, re not reperfuse um, correctly. Huh. This kind so, of so it's not just a joint, it's systemic. See, it's systemic, yeah. So that's the point. What originates in the joint from that vascular remodeling and then does it cause hypertension and then to Donna's point also affect as hypertension does other vascular beds probably or is it the other way around or mixture for whatever reason do these patients or do people with hemophilia have this higher propensity for high blood pressure and hypertension and then does it affect their joints and then it's sort of the vicious cycle backwards I don't think that's clearly understood but there seem it seems to be like that in, in the general population with osteoarthritis and um, with much less vascular abnormalities in the joints than in patients with hemophilia, but still enough to sort of fuel that hypothesis that was that nature review. I don't think it's quite clear, but it seems to hang together. And there haven't been any studies in other types of bleeds other than joint bleeds. So what? if somebody had a muscle bleed or, or um, another type of bleed, there's no studies that would um, say that the same thing is happening there. No, but indirectly, there might be some evidence and that dates back to way before clotting factor prophylaxis, or even when I go now to Mozambique, um, to developing countries where there is less of it, if people get these muscle bleeds um, and maybe how pseudotumors originate, because these these patients maybe can still remember the era of bad pseudotumors. And those pseudotumors on occasions are very vascularized. So you have, so the hypothesis here is you have this hematoma that's not resolving and it's getting neovascularized almost like a tumor. Um, and then at some point gets fibrosed and becomes a, a really nasty, nasty um, pseudotumor. But that vascularization here might be happening might be happening too if these hematomas don't resolve, if there's no treatment. So it could be. Okay. Um, Susan Booth asks if there are preferred antihypertensive or blood pressure medications for people with hemophilia, given their bleeding disorder. Are there any, I, I guess another way of asking this, are there any that we should avoid? No, I think one should just go by recommendations of American Heart Association. Um, and go just down that same path. And for instance, American Heart recommends that people or patients with high, high, higher high blood pressure, like let's say systolic over 160, you're not even supposed to start with one pill. You're supposed to start with two pills. 
and tell that my 20 year old patient, they will <laughs> they'll just not go down that route. You know, this is the, um, the upward struggle I'm talking about. But no, you should follow um, AHA guidelines. Okay. Um, another question here is, do you feel that the relevance of hypertension concerns in hemophilia patients would give more justification or ammunition for um, patient coverage of previously restricted therapies, um, drugs for hemophilia? So I'm, uh, this is from probably a payer perspective, um, trying to get prior offs and coverage. Well, I am not entirely sure because I think no one has shown yet that other than by inference, it's clear if you may not have this bad joint disease, if you forego clotting factor, you might not be as hypertensive. Um, but I don't think it's been shown that giving the blood, giving this, giving the clotting factor will reduce blood pressure. So yeah, so I'm not sure how far that would go. I always, I always found though that inundating um, a, a prior auth with uh, data is very helpful. I send articles, so um, you can always try. Exactly. You can always try. Exactly, there's no harm in that. Uh -uh. So um, one more question, we're almost at the end and uh, I do want to um, point out as um, Samantha did that this session qualifies for continuing education for providers and nurses. And um, this slide does tell you how to access those, um, uh, the, that CME. Um, but one more question, you mentioned the C4M2 um, and it was highlighted as being elevated in joint bleeds. Are there any further studies that are looking into this as a biomarker and how realistic is it that this can be readily accessible as a blood test to identify joint bleeds for the average patient? Yeah, so there is there was an ASH um, abstract just last last ASH 2021, and it's been developed in a full publication now. Um, investigators have used ADVAID, it is Takeda driven, but it was an ADVAID study a pharma, based on pharmacokinetics um, to show that there's certain bleed, bleed reduction. I think Dr. Glamro published that paper in, in blood um, to show better bleed control with higher trough levels if pharmacokinetically driven. And now um, they are looking at plasma biomarkers and they have used these. And again, just like in our study, those type four collagen turnover markers, specifically that, that CM42 and the other pro type four um, can be followed and are quite reduced or get quite reduced once clotting factor prophylaxis is started. And um, there's also a difference between the, the different target trough levels. So yes, we can rec recapitulate all of that. How readily available these things become to measure success, I think will be lying with Nordic Biosciences. This is the company in Denmark who um, is a biomarker company and they have all of those commercially available. Perhaps they can make them commercially available for hemophilia and bleeding and other things. But first of all, I don't know for rapid bleed detection, how fast the turnaround you would be. You know, you need something for diagnosing a bleed that comes back right away. It cannot be a week later in a send out. Yeah. Um, but for overall predictors of joint health and a treatment working, where you don't need it back tomorrow, it's okay if it comes back next week, that might be a possibility. All right. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, a great discussion. And thank you to everybody who is present here today. I see um, quite a few of our SMEs. Um, we uh, refer to them as our subject matter experts. They are those who are most knowledgeable about their journey with a bleeding disorder. Um, so I'm happy to see them here and, um, and um, our researchers too. So um, I hope that they got as much out of this as I know I did. Um, we have all of the information for continuing education and we look forward to hosting another uh, research journal club uh, within a couple of months and you'll be getting that information. So again, thank you, Dr. Vandragalski. We appreciate thank you. That. Thank you for the opportunity and for everyone sacrificing 
this hour to um to follow this journey of hypertension and to the subject matter experts please take your blood pressure pills yeah <laughs> thanks all right everybody have a wonderful rest of your day and a great um weekend coming up take care wonderful thank bye -bye. you thank you bye -bye.